You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Daniel Sinner with today's discussion. Business leaders have accused the British Chancellor George Osborne of failing to kick-start the economy by doing too little too slowly. A survey by the Institute of Directors shows many believe the government's attempts at economic and business reform have been ineffective. The survey reveals that the vast majority think the government's reforms in areas like reducing tax and red tape have also been ineffective. The coalition has recently been urged to end austerity and criticised for failing to invest in big infrastructure projects. Well, joining me for today's discussion is David Newbury, Professor of Economics from the University of Cambridge. In the studio is Mark Littlewood, the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs. David Smith is the Economics Editor of the Sunday Times. And Professor Walter Den Haan is Professor of Macroeconomics at the London School of Economics. Um, I'll start with you, Mark Littlewood. Is the Chancellor's Deficit Reduction Plan on the right track? I suppose it is on the right track, but it is an extraordinarily modest proposal that he's put forward. I sometimes feel as if uh, there's a parallel universe of political debate going on in which there are arguments about vast cuts and the age of austerity. The truth of the matter is that public expenditure is about flatlining, that we are still running very substantial deficits, that it is the declared intention of George Osborne to add about 350 to £400 billion pounds to the national debt between now and the next general election. If this is austerity, I wouldn't want to see what largesse looks like. Um, so there is an awful lot uh, of heat and not much light about the uh, the discussion. We are effectively, uh, despite the protestations of uh, both the government and the opposition, are actually operating a substantial Keynesian fiscal stimulus package at the moment by spending considerably more money than we're bringing in. And that doesn't seem to be working. Professor David Newbury, Professor of Economics at the University of Cambridge. Yes, I would strongly disagree with that, and I think it highlights the problem we have with public accounting. We talk about a deficit without saying whether it's on current or capital expenditure. I think we do need to cut current expenditure, but we need to massively increase investment, and that way the deficit and the increased debt would be matched, or one would hope exceeded, by the increased value of the assets we create. Our country is desperately short of infrastructure. Infrastructure is needed if we're going to be productive. Uh, We've underinvested in roads and we seem to be cutting it back even further. It's the policy of insanity. David Smith, economics editor of the Sunday Times. The deficit reduction programme is uh, is still ongoing, but it has run into uh, a little bit of sand just recently. So uh, if we look at the latest figures, they are not showing an improvement on a year ago. So that is slightly worrying given that uh, as Mark said it wasn't a particularly aggressive reduction that was planned so we only aim to come down by a few billion between last year and this year. I think it's a it's a very mixed picture we've got at the moment if you uh, think back to uh, to 2010 and people said well this uh, this austerity program is going to is doomed to failure it's never going to be the case that the private sector for example will generate enough jobs to replace the jobs being cut in the public sector well in fact that is wrong because what has happened is that we've seen a big increase in private sector employment which has more than offset the reduction in public sector jobs so that part of it is i think uh, going along fine i do have some sympathy with professor newbury's point which is that too much of the emphasis in terms of trying to control public spending has been on the capital expenditure cuts, which uh, the coalition government inherited from, from Labour. Labour intended these big capital spending cuts. And current spending, as Mark says, is increasing, is still incre- increasing quite rapidly. So I think the balance of the fiscal reduction programme is quite badly wrong. Professor Walter Den Haan from uh, the London School of Economics. So I think there's... Uh too much emphasis on the uh, on the austerity uh, part of uh, what the government is doing. I think uh, Mark already talked a little bit about it. This is that uh, in terms of other supply side incentives, the government could do a lot more. I agree with uh, David Newberry. Is is that I mean, in some sense, this would be a great time to invest. I mean, interest rates are very low, and right, there clearly is a need for demand. But um, the qu- and then the idea would be if the government borrowed a bit more now to finance those investment projects. 
But then its key is, is that they make it credible, is, is that when the economy starts taking off again, that then they really reduce government spending. Because I think right right now a lot of businesses are worried about sort of you know what's the sort of medium term outlook, and uh, but the question is whether the government can credibly do that. Mark Littlewood, over the last week there's been calls for George Osborne to end austerity and start spending on things such as infrastructure. Is that really the answer? I don't disagree with the point that that, that David Newbury and others have made that um, ex- government expenditure that's about investment is is probably better than government expenditure which is simply about consumption. I don't disagree with that. Um, so within whatever the spending envelope is, I I would like to see a higher proportion of that envelope spent on um, capital projects. But I, I don't think that's a silver bullet solution. The overall level of government spending in the United Kingdom has spiralled out of control, um, getting to, in broad terms, about 50% of overall GDP being public expenditure. Uh, by way of comparison, uh, generally, in the fastest growing, most successful economies in the world, you'll see that the public sector accounts for about 25% of GDP. And in the former Soviet Union, it was reckoned to account for about 70% of GDP. So we're slightly closer to the former Soviet Union than we are to the fastest growing countries on the planet in terms of our overall share. There is an important argument about what needs to be done within that envelope, and more investment would be a good plan. But it's got to be got under control, and I think fast and rapidly, and much more aggressively than the government is actually aiming to do, which is uh, an intention to cut by, I think, somewhere between half and 1% per annum. Um, There's a language problem here as well. I think that the the government and George Osborne and others have allowed uh, a debate to emerge that the choice is between austerity and growth. Uh, And I don't think that is the choice at all. We we need to start rapidly moving towards living within our means. But there are a whole range of other things. You referred to the survey at the start on the supply side that the government could be doing and are basically ducking, which I think would strongly encourage growth over the medium term. But the efforts at deregulating employment law reform and the like have been somewhat parlous to date. Let's bring in Professor David Newbury here. The language that we've been hearing over the past week is that the Chancellor is on the wrong way. We should be promoting growth by investing public money into infrastructure. Do you agree that that is the way forward to start getting growth and ending the age of austerity? Yes, but let me qualify it. I don't think it's big projects, and I think the idea that we're going to save the nation by building High Speed 2 is completely bonkers. What we need are projects that are profitable, not projects that are big. And the Eddington report on transport infrastructure found any number of projects with a very, very high payoff to the, to the economy. So sensible investment, not rhetorical gestures towards things like the Seven Barrage. You, you mentioned the existed. Eddington report. What, what would you say is the best project out of that that would be ones that we could invest in? Well, there are two um, that stand out. Uh, One of them is exactly what the rhetorical uh, position of the government is, which is to stimulate private investment, and that is to get the third runway at Heathrow, which would be entirely privately financed and would relax the constraints on trade with our rapidly growing trade partners. And the other are the road projects, any number of which, not particularly big ones, but all around the country, there are constraints, congestion on the road network. We don't need more rail at the moment. We need more roads. That's where the congestion is. David Smith, more roads rather than more rail? Well, uh, quite possibly. I mean, uh, my reading of uh, what has happened recently was that there has been no U-turn among these economists. Uh, Professor Newbury will uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, what they were saying back then was that you needed to uh, attack current expenditure, as Ma- as Mark says. Uh, but that didn't imply that you had to uh, slash infrastructure spending. And uh, and uh, as I say, I said earlier, it was a mistake. I think, for the government to do that. But um, I think, you know, there are lessons of history in what we can do in this. And I I quite liked uh, in that, uh, you know, in that response to the original letter, what Professor Newbury was saying um, uh, in the New Statesman when he was asked by them. And, And one of the things he said was that if you look back Uh, to the 1930s. One of the engines of economic growth was house building, strong increase in house building during that uh, period. 
And uh, uh, for him, you know, one of the ways you could bring that about was to ease the planning rules. And if you allow the builders to build on some of the not very attractive green belt land around cities, you'll get a lot more house building going. You need to tackle the finance side of it as well. But that is a, a no cost, no fiscal stimulus way of getting economic activity going. And that's one I would uh, uh, agree with wholeheartedly. A reminder that you're listening to the Voice of Russia in London. I'm Daniel Sinner with today's discussion. Joining us over the phone is Professor David Newbury, Professor of Economics from the University of Cambridge. In the studio is Mark Littlewood, the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs. David Smith is the Economics Editor at the Sunday Times. And Professor Walter Den Haan is Professor of Macroeconomics at the London School of Economics. Um, Professor Walter Den Haan, we'll bring you in here. Public investment in infrastructure? I mean, it cannot hurt, right? This is a good time because it inter- rates are low but I mean I think that's a small thing but I want to if I can respond to the U-turn I'm not so sure, sure there hasn't been a U-turn I think academics have become a lot more worried that we are stuck now in a bad equilibrium where consumers don't demand commodities good and goods because uh, they're worried about becoming unemployed and firms don't hire because there's no demand for their products right and so then some academics they say is that well, we have to get out of that bad equilibrium and then maybe the government can kickstart that by just spending a lot. So, right, so I've, I've seen, right, over the last few years, several of my colleagues sort of changing their idea about, you know, whether we are in that kind of bad equilibrium. Right, it could very well be that, right, personally, I think that it could be that we are in such a bad equilibrium. I'm not so sure it's just that the government can get us out of it. But, 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 but on, I mean, on that, uh, as David rightly points, uh, uh, points out, we shouldn't be particularly concerned about firms not hiring. Yes, I mean, actual consumer demand on the high street and the likes is pretty flat. The, the GDP figures, insofar as we believe them, are very flat. Flat. But one point of considerable encouragement has been that the private sector has stepped up in terms of employment. I mean, that is going very firmly in the right direction. Well, and those who were strongly opposed to any sort of public sector cuts doubted that the private sector would be able to do that. And even in this relatively non-benign climate, the results from the private sector in terms of employment look encouraging. Not heroic, but encouraging. Uh, Professor, do you want to come uh, but the, I mean, the unemployment rate is still high. And so it's the output that's generated by sort of the jobs is low because you know GDP is still flat. And there was a survey by this Institute of Directors, and it has this really scary numbers that they said is that 40% of those surveyed they postponed an investment or an employment decision because of you know the uncertainty facing the economy. I mean that, those are you know terrible numbers. So I really don't think you can say that the employment situation is good. David Smith, let's bring you in here, economics editor of the Sunday Times. What we did hear from the IOD report was that businesses are putting off making these decisions at the moment. What can we do to start getting them involved and making faster decisions? How is the government going to get business confidence back into the economy? Well, it, it's tough, and I, I think um, I, I am very sceptical about the uh, the GDP figures. I mean, I simply don't believe that the economy is smaller than it was two years ago, which is what they suggest, um, and I think there will be substantial revisions. But what we are seeing, of course, is the danger of the publication of gloomy figures like that, in the sense that businesses think things are bad, th- p- uh, businesses think there's no light at the end of the tunnel. So, as you say, they postpone those decisions, uh, tie it in with the, you know, the ongoing crisis in the Eurozone, and there is, there is always a reason for, for businesses not to do something. And I, I suppose the lesson of the crisis was that those who were cautious before the crisis tended to do better through the crisis than those who who took risks. So I think we are in a a risk-averse environment. I think, you know, getting those animal spirits going is is tough in this this situation. I don't think it is suddenly going to be lifted by the government announcing, you know, three or four infrastructure projects. I think it could be lifted in the sense of, uh, you know, people feeling, businesses feeling more confident by some of Mark's supply-side reforms, you know, deregulation and so on. But we should be you know, we should know that those don't affect the economy straight away. I mean, you know, supply side reforms take years to to feed through. Their their main effect in the short term is on confidence. So I think that is the kind of thing that maybe the government should be thinking of at the moment. Professor David Newbury from the University of Cambridge, what are your thoughts about uh, David Smith's uh, remarks just now? 
Um, well, on the U-turn, I think uh, he's quite right that most of us thought that the current expenditure was, if not out of control, then moving in the wrong direction, um, and that there was a very great need to rebalance and in particular to redress the underinvestment that this country has been in uh, undertaking in infrastructure. I, I also think, I mean, if you look at the one remnant of Soviet planning that this country has retained from 1947, it's the Town and Country Planning Act. We have agricultural land on the edge of towns, which is worth £6,000 an acre. If it gets planning permission, it's worth £600,000 an acre. And that's an insane way of trying to um, stimulate the economy, is to hold back the one thing for which we desperately need more houses. David Smith? Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, and the numbers on that are, are, you know, completely and utterly convincing. We're building roughly 100,000 homes a year at the moment. We need at least 250,000 a year. There is pent up demand there. The problem is, is A, on the credit side, on the, on the uh, supply of finance side, but B, on giving the builders a new incentive. And I, I, I've always thought that, um, you know, we, we make, you know, we, we regard the green belt as somehow sacred. A lot of the green belt is, is very unattractive scrubland on the edge of cities, which could be freed up. It happened, it worked in the 1930s, enormous house building boom then. It was the main way we got out of the, uh, uh, the crisis, the depression at the start of the decade. It could work again. I think it just needs a bit more imagination and a bit more determination by the politicians to take on vested interests, which I think my big criticism of this government was apart from a few, you know, unfortunate errors in the budget, which were errors like, you know, Cornish pasties and things like that. In the main, they are not prepared to take on vested interests. It's quite a timid government, I think. You know, it's, on the face of it, it's got a bold austerity plan, but it's doing it quite timidly. And I think that is the, that is the main criticism I would have of them. Professor Valton and Hahn, can we really build our, our way out of this recession? The government can do a lot more sort of on the supply side. And sort of, you know, the housing is just one part of it. But I really think is that that's where we should, you know, think about the solution, not about, you know, more or less austerity. I think the important thing is really is, is that think about deregulation, labor market uh, reform, and the housing could very well be part of that. Then we also have to look at consumers, though. You know, the government tried to encourage banks to lend to small businesses and lend to consumers for mortgages. It's all very well them pumping money into house building. But what if they can't get banks to lend for people to buy the houses? Uh, yeah, so they're trying very hard now to, uh, right, to motivate banks to, uh, to do the, the lending. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so the, the confidence part is a big part. And in some sense, it's that you, know, you, you got to have a, not a timid plan. You got to do it together, right? Because if people have confidence, then banks will start lending too. And if they don't have confidence, then banks will not start lending. So the question is, you know, how can you sort of best change that? You know, you start with some investment plans and then some housing plans. And then you work on the, you know, the supply side, the deregulation and the, uh, the labor market reform. I think uh, you know, a lot could happen. And Mark Littlewood. I think that the, the issue here is obviously after you know, a period of gloomy economic times in discussions such as these, there's a, there's a danger of, of hoping that any of the four of us can come up with a single magic bullet and sort of say, if we just did this, then you know, growth would be 4% per annum, unemployment would be solved, you know, credit would be eased. The truth of the matter is that there's an absolute plethora of things that, in my view, um, can be done and should be done. So... Easing planning laws, I mean, I think a very sensible supply side reform, it, it's not going to magically, you know, render the economy considerably more productive overnight, but it will have an effect. The government's tended to back away from it for vested interest reasons, despite the fact that only 10% of England is developed, and a good proportion of that is actually people's back gardens. So, I mean, 40% of London is green space, for crying out loud. We, we, we are almost a bit like in a kind of agrarian utopia, rather than a properly built up modern economy. But the there are a hundred things that need to be tried. I mean, ju just this weekend, there was an argument about Sunday trading um, laws. You know, should we now, after the Olympics experiment, actually allow bigger shops to stay open for more than six hours on a Sunday? Now, again, uh, liberalising those laws will not suddenly kickstart the economy, 
But it does seem to me pretty extraordinary that if we want to create more employment hours in this country, that we potentially have a law that makes it a criminal offence to sell bread and butter in a supermarket at nine o'clock on a Sunday. And that, so there's a hundred or so things that need to be gone through here. Uh, David's quite right that, that the government seems to sort of bulk at, at, at 95 of them and then water down the other five that, it exact, that it's willing to pursue. And I'm afraid that means that the march out of a difficult economic time, uh, whether it's a recession or not, I think it's still be, to be determined, is going to be an awful lot slower. A reminder that you're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Daniel Sinner with today's discussion. Joining us over the phone is Professor David Newbury, Professor of Economics from the University of Cambridge. In the studio is Mark Littlewood, the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs. David Smith is the Economics Editor of the Sunday Times. And Professor Walter Den Haan is Professor of Macroeconomics at the London School of Economics. Um, David Smith, we'll go back to you, Economics Editor of the Sunday Times. One of the um, interesting things, I mean, just going back to this issue of, if you like, the damage that the, uh, the the financial crisis did to us. And I think this is one of those areas where success, successive governments, because this started, of course, under the Labour government and has continued under the coalition, have just taken too long to grasp a basic problem. And one of those basic problems is the, uh, is the supply of credit into the economy, both for small and medium-sized firms and for people who want to buy homes. So, you know, the first half of 2007, just before the crisis, two-thirds of mortgages, two-thirds of new mortgages in the UK came from the so-called wholesale markets, from the money markets. One-third came as a result of savers putting their deposits in banks and building societies. Now, we lost that two-thirds. There should have been a response to that almost immediately to say, how are we going to maintain some kind of mortgage market through this crisis, you know, what can we do as the Treasury and the Bank of England to do that? We're only now seeing the response to that through this so-called funding for lending scheme. So that may improve things, but it is very late. However, uh, one thing I would say is that um, you write off the British com- consumer at your peril. You know, so the British consumer has had a terrible time. You know, they've uh, they can't get mortgages. They've seen an unexpectedly high rate of inflation, which has squeezed their real incomes very hard. Earnings have been going up by 2%. Inflation's been 5%. So it's not surprising that they, they haven't been spending. But just lately, they've started to spend again. So retail sales volumes, you know, inflation adjusted retail sales are up 3% on a year ago. I think consumers will carry on spending as long as inflation stays low and hopefully falls further. You get some recovery in those real incomes and the consumer belatedly plays a little bit of a part in this recovery, which he he hasn't done so far. So I think that is one positive thing that may happen over the coming months. Professor David Newbury, some quite positive comments in terms of consumers from David Smith. Would you agree it's going to be a positive outlook for consumers? Well, I'm not so sure about that because I don't have my ear to the ground as closely as David does. And I agree there are probably a 100 things that should be done, but there are some things that the government should just stop doing and cutting investment and cutting research budgets and things like that. Uh, That's uh, the most important thing to do. I would also agree that the mortgage problem is actually very complicated because we've got ourselves in a position through planning laws in which the value of a house is 50% the bricks and 50% the land. And the land should be 5%. Uh, So if we could lower the price of land a great deal, then the cost of housing would come down dramatically and that would have, in the long run, a huge effect. But of course, it would put existing mortgage holders in a very difficult position. It would simplify the problem of lending for new houses, but complicate the problem of existing mortgages for what are seriously overpriced properties. Professor Valtan and Han, we've been hearing today that some of the solutions could be loosening restrictions on businesses to try and give them a bit more confidence as a solution to this. Would you agree? No, absolutely. I mean, a big reason why right, consumers you know, held back in spending is uh, employment prospects. Right? So if there is a, right, a vision out there is that the business environment will grow and flourish, then you, know, you see these employment numbers changing is that consumers would be less worried about you know, making those long-term commitments. Right? So I think these, these things would, uh, you know, would go together. So, so if we get the, right, the firms getting more confident, 
in investing and hiring is then the consumers will follow. The thing is, we have been putting a lot of pressure onto the private sector to take on more workers and, and support the wider economy whilst cutting back public spending, and that hasn't seemed to work so far. Well, I think it hasn't worked because, you know, as mentioned earlier, is the government has been quite timid. It doesn't look like they have a really strong, right, committed vision, right, to sort of change the business environment. Mark Littlewood, um, from, do, you, do you think we need to be taking these big, bolder steps instead? Well, well much bolder. I mean, it, uh, again, the, the, the sort of whole story about um, business stepping up to the plate, deregulation, etc., is another example of the government talking a big game. You know, you'll hear the Chancellor or the Prime Minister sort of saying, you know, British business needs to step up to the plate. But the actual policy and strategy seems to be based on not much more than the power of prayer. So the, there isn't actually a particularly coherent list of policies that will make it easier to do business in Britain. I dare say it's nice to be at the Confederation of British Industry conference and for the Prime Minister to sort of step forward or the Chancellor to step forward and say, British business is marvellous, we wish you well. But good wishes and goodwill won't cut it. So again, having come to office promising a bonfire of red tape, there hasn't even been a gentle smouldering of red tape. They've probably stopped the situation getting enormously worse, but that isn't creating an environment in which you can expect businesses and entrepreneurs to flourish more easily today than you might have expected them to flourish three or four years ago. David Smith, a bonfire of red tape. Well, I mean, I think it's interesting when you, uh, you know, for, for years and years under, um, under the previous government, you looked at, you know, we had a pretty deregulated low tax economy when uh, the Labour Party took over in 1997. And there is no doubt that the economy was re-regulated and taxes were increased, but it didn't seem to have any, any adverse effect on, uh, on economic growth during that period. The economy grew fine. We now know it was, it was unstable and unsustainable and so on. Now, so we're not talking about, you know, some sort of Wild West economy where you're reducing regulations to a level they've never been to before. We're just talking about, you know, unwinding some of that re-regulation that occurred over, over 13 years. And for me, you know, the, um, the, you know, the most disturbing thing is when you look at Britain in comparison with other economies that should be in a similar state. So, for example, Sweden is doing very well at the moment, grow, has been growing very rapidly uh, in a similar situation to the UK. It's not part of the Eurozone and so on, but he's doing much better. But Germany, you know, Germany, well, you, you, one thing you could take for granted was that German unemployment would be higher than the UK. It was a, uh, it was a sclerotic over-restricted, over-regulated economy. You look at Germany now, doing very well. Uh, these mini-jobs that the Germans have got seem to be very successful, and I know the government is thinking of looking at those. But, you know, there are good ideas out there, and some of them are in place and being adopted by other countries. And frankly, you know, if you'd said to me 10 years ago that we'd be in a situation where the German labour market was a lot more uh, effective than the UK labour market, I would just would not have believed you. And, it, and at the moment it is. Professor David Newbury, we heard about this bonfire of red tape from Mark Littlewood. The IOD saying today that the cost and complexity of doing business in the UK is just far too hard and the government needs to take some bold steps. Do you think that's the solution? All governments claim they're going to deal with red tape. No government succeed in doing very much. And I would go back and say, well, what is it that causes growth? And it's quite simple. It's investment. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you to all of my guests. Joining us over the phone was Professor David Newbury, Professor of Economics from the University of Cambridge. In the studio is Mark Littlewood, the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs, David Smith, the Economics Editor of the Sunday Times, and Professor Walter Den Haan is Professor of Macroeconomics at the London School of Economics.